thank you so much for joining me again. I just want to kind of start with an introductory kind of question. Um, yeah. Who is Fable? Who, what would you describe yourself as? So I love wildlife. I live in the middle of nowhere on 40 acres in the forest and I love surfing and working at the dingo sanctuary. So I think most importantly for me is like the connection to place and the wild. I'm really glad that I found writing. I never really had any direction or I'm a high school graduate yeah. and um, I'm from a working class family and I moved out of home really young. So I thought I won't go to uni, I'll just work for a while and maybe go later. <clears throat> and I never got around to doing that. I just um, I ended up working as a postman, which I liked, and then... Luckily, my brother really pushed me to pursue writing because he knew that I wanted to do that when I was younger. So I ended up at TAFE and that was the start of Past the Shallow. So I'm just so grateful for that. So I sort of found, stumbled into writing again later and somehow made it work. I do want to talk a little bit about... Tasmania and growing up yeah. in Tasmania because I know both past the shallows and when the night comes are kind of based out of that um yeah. I was wondering how was that experience for you growing up and do you feel like it really contributed to how you would tell these stories later on and that connection with nature as well yeah so T Tassie was not altogether like a great experience for my brother and I so we um it was just mum and my brother and I and um, we were, you know, sort of left uh, the mainland with no money and no possessions and, and Hobart was sort of a sanctuary for my mum and um, to sort of start over again. But for my brother and I, it was a really a place of unknowns and we were very lonely and that isolation of that island, you know, just looking out and the, the next bit of land's Antarctica and the weather and the snow and the old buildings and the strange forest, the ancient forest and the ancient Southern Ocean and, the, and then on top of that the history of um, the convicts and all of the torture and terrible things that went on there and then again after that or before that then you've got massacres and the genocide of um the first Australians in Tasmania and it, it's all there still you can yeah. feel it so as a kid and especially as a sem sensitive kid I could feel it all so it haunted me when I left Tasmania I was 16 and I thought I am never ever going back to live there ever but it kept coming up in the writing and it was really frustrating because I did not want to be in that cold, sad, weird, strange place feeling that I didn't belong like Harry does. And so, yeah. but it kept coming up and I just had to give in. And so all of those fears and the ghosts and nightmares and things that I'd pushed aside, they all wanted to come back up and it helped me deal with that part of my childhood and come to appreciate Tassie as a completely beautiful and amazing place. So I don't feel those feelings anymore when I go there. I really love it. Also, my love and fear of the Southern Ocean. So it's the most amazing force on the planet, right? It controls all yeah. of the weather systems. <laughs> and um, it's incredible, but it's also terrifying. Yeah. So... As a child, I was terrified of it. Now I'm fascinated by it. So it's cool. Yeah. I do want to um, pick up on the fact that you said that you were a very sensitive child. And I wonder if that kind of pushed the way that you write in this very real, raw, emotional way. Absolutely. I think you know how being sensitive is seen as a weakness yeah. by a lot of people and it is hard to be sensitive because you feel everything and you're emotional and you cry a lot and you feel yeah. pain from everything, including animals, and it's really tough and if people think you're just an emotional mess. But if you can harness that, the flip side of that is to be able to write or create and make people feel. Yeah. So 
what I know now is if I feel it and really feel it and put it into the words and the rhythm and the scene, then I know the reader will feel it. And that's like power, right? That's a power that I have. I can do that. And that's cool. So now I know that being sensitive is a gift. The other thing that I always used to get in trouble for was daydreaming. Like, oh, you're always daydreaming. What a waste of time. What a waste of time. You're wasting, people would say, you know, you've wasted half a year daydreaming. And now I know it's the absolute key to being a writer is to be able to daydream fully like real whole worlds daydream I can do that <laughs> so yeah. um, again I go back and tell my little self just keep daydreaming don't listen to anyone I want to go back to you said you were a postie obviously and that you kind of were always interested in writing but it was kind of something that happened later on so I'm wondering um with this very interesting kind of career journey that you've had how did you adapt to all those different changes? First of all, um, I didn't pursue writing really because of fear. So I came out of high school and I was a really good science and math student, but I really loved stories and I thought maybe I'd like to do something with stories. I used to do a little magazine so back in the day, it's the equivalency of a blog. It's called a zine. And so kids would yeah. make them and you'd photocopy them and we'd send them to each other around the world. And, you know, I had friends around the world. And I loved it. I loved doing this zine. And it was creative writing and then interviews of my favourite bands and things like that. And after high school, I just thought I can't. I'm a high school graduate. I, I don't have a degree. Who am I to be a writer? I can't be a writer. I'm not good enough. So it's those, those fears, like I'm not good enough and I'm not even going to try because it's impossible, right? So that's just your stupid self-talk telling you you're not good mm-hmm. enough. But I listened to that till I was like 30 or nearly 30. So that's it wasn't wasted time, but it is as well. Like if I could tell younger people now, just try and start now, even though it's so scary. Even if you don't tell anyone, just like keep writing. Because I stopped writing completely. I stopped doing my zine. I stopped all of it. And I just worked. And I always thought, oh, maybe later. But my brother, he's like the first person in my family to go to university. And he went to art school. And he is a sculptor. And he's quite a successful sculptor now. And so he was doing his master's and, you know, I was so proud of him. And he said, well, what about you? Are you going to be a postman forever? And he really got at me and he's the only person who can do that. And um, I was like, no, shut up. I don't want to do that. (laughs) Um, But it it, it bugged me so much that I did look up courses and I did try and get a folio together and I ended up at the Centre of Adult Education, which is a fantastic place, TAFE, because it's, for everyone that you know the the ages range from 18 to 90 in my some of my classes and disabled people people from all walks of life in Melbourne and I loved that having said that I walked into the class thinking I still can't be a writer and I still was a part-time postman and I just thought I'll just try I'll just do some short stories and um over the years I just kept a hope that maybe it's possible, maybe me, just a little bit of hope. So I really worked hard and tried to push my stories out to wherever I could put them. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't get anything placed. I didn't get anything for years. And then, you know, you get a long listing or a short listing and it just is like, oh, my God, now I've got more um, energy to keep going and to keep going and to keep going and to keep going. And this, it was the same with the novel. I just decided to just try and believe as much as I could and work really hard on it in all my spare time. Mm-hmm. So I still didn't think it was possible, but part of me believed it was enough of me to keep going. One of my teachers, um, Janie Wunchi, was really amazing and she asked us all this really hard question and it was if you knew that this novel that you've been working on for three years and probably will work on for another three will never, ever get published, will you still, will you finish it? Will you continue? 
And that's really hard. And I thought, why would you continue? But then it was like, no, I have to. I have to finish this story. So then I knew, okay, well, it's worth it anyway. So just put in the time. You said that you send zines around the world when you were younger. And I think that kind of really speaks to me of, um, I guess, the human connection, um, which is a very big theme in all of your books as well. And I really love that aspect of it. I think the connections that you build, especially in past the shallows, which absolutely made me cry, by the way. <laughs> um, well, I me think too. That's it such made me an cry too. Thing. Um, I lived. I lived for the post, like old school mail. Like every yeah. day, I'd be like, "Oh my god, what's coming today?" Zines from my friends. I'm still friends with heaps of those people. What values did you take? from like your past experiences and put them into writing or vice versa if when you started writing there were new values that you kind of took into your life the character of like someone like harry which is really based on how i feel about my little brother he's like i guess kindness Mm. is a value in that book like harry has this incredible um kindness even though his world is really harsh and he holds on to that optimism and kindness with everything he has relationship between siblings is something that I'm fascinated with so it's in all of my books that relationship is like the longest relationship you have in your life if you both live to a like average age so um that's crazy right they know you better than anyone and they were there to witness all the stuff and they remember it slightly differently but it's which is funny but um I just yeah my brother and I are really close so sibling is a theme and I can see it now I've over and over and over I've kind of told that same story about siblings having to rely on each other to survive hardships. I only read Past the Shallows recently but it really changed the way that I think about a lot of things and that kind of subtlety but also very raw realness. It really got to me as a kind of writing style that I'm not very familiar with. Like I haven't seen it that profoundly before, I guess. So I know that it changed the way that I think. I want to kind of ask you, how did it change you in like terms of your life? What does it mean to you? It's so hard to get a book published. And I got into a manuscript development program with my publishing company and um, they told us all there's no, no one's going to get a deal, but it's just to have a one-on-one with the publisher. And it was kind of like an industry boot camp and we were all so nervous and felt like frauds. And anyway, I had a one-on-one with um, one of the publishers and she was so encouraging and she said, look, this isn't ready, but it's really good and you need to go away for a year and you need to make it a priority and you need to work your ass off on it and then send it back to me and I'll I'll see what I can do. So I did that and I took it really seriously. I made it my job and I I think I even quit work at that point and just um, went into my studio every day and worked like it was my job and um, with hope, a little bit of hope. Finally got through and then they said, look at, Australian um, literary fiction doesn't sell well and I but you know congratulations and I thought wow it doesn't matter it's out and if I sell 1,000 books I'll be like that's it I've paid back the advance of like four thousand dollars and it's great um but it like booksellers loved it and it took off and then it's still going and now it's in year 12 English Um, around the country which I love teaching those classes to get so much out of that hearing their take on things and what they tell me and and some kids tell me that they they hate me because the the book brought up trauma for them or they loved it or they hate reading but they loved this book and it's just it's cool so it means so much Pastor Charles means I mean gave me this opportunity to be a writer and not be a postman anymore it gave me confidence in my childlike writing style because of my I guess because you know I'm not a PhD student I'm a high school graduate and there's nothing wrong with that but I always felt like not good enough or I write too short my sentences are too simple and that comes from 
drafting. I draft really heavily, so I take out every single excess word until it's like the essence and the right rhythm. And that drafting, I think, is what gives you the feeling because all of the underneath layers are still there but they're not on the page but they're there in the feel I don't know it's like magic are there any human experiences that you've had that really contributed to writing the book or that show through the book and its characters so again I mean like I spoke about my granddad but that kindness of the granddad in the book with Joe and then George with Harry that's really a big that's me. That's like mm-hmm. me sitting playing with my matchbook cars while my grandpa smokes his pipe. So, and my brother, um, like they just meant the world to us. We um, would stay with them most of the time because my dad was building a house. So, the first, you know, from baby to like five, we were there in my grandma's flat with my grandpa. And they were a massive influence on me and this incredible kindness when they had nothing. They were really poor working-class immigrants. and But it's, all we needed was there and the love and protection have made me who I am. Absolutely. And so they're there all the time with me. So they're there in the books. That kindness, I wanted Harry to have that kindness. He needed to have that because his life is so harsh. Yeah. And... Um, he needed it more than anyone. And unfortunately, Miles is that of that age. Like me being the older sibling, you've got so much more responsibility. You can't stay in that childlike optimism because it's gone, it's been shattered. And it, it, you can no longer daydream. He can no longer daydream and hope for anything because his reality, he understands the reality. Whereas Harry can still stay a child. And when people talk about how sad it is that Harry died and it is, it's terrifying and it kills me and I still can't read that scene, which is the last scene I wrote of him chasing the dog because I didn't want him to be in the water and I didn't want him to be frightened. And I cried my eyes out and I still can't read that scene. But Harry is free because imagine if he hadn't have died and he'd grown up and that optimism was shattered and then he becomes miles and then he knows the reality and there's no way out and then that is that's free it sounds crazy but i i know he's free um he can stay how he is um he doesn't have to deal with the darkness ever um unlike miles who's already there so Harry's death saves both of them, which is yeah. awful, right? It saves Miles as well. So it came from a place, feelings about Tasmania, the kindness of my grandparents, knowing what it's like to have a lot of responsibility um, and looking after your younger sibling and trying to keep them in that optimism when yours isn't there anymore. I still think it's like a hopeful book and it has mm. some light in it and that's Harry and also that Miles gets to go you know, with Joe and finally has that support that he hasn't ever had. So you'd know when you write, like, surprising things about yourself come out in other characters, right? Definitely. I really love your characters as well because for me I have this thing where I feel like each character that I write, I kind of leave a piece of myself in them. And I Absolutely. see a piece of myself in them. And when I read like other people's works, I try and focus on that as well and see where have they left that, you know. And I can see that very clearly in your characters. And it's, it makes it's really more real, I guess. I, I yeah. mean, that you know, it they are real. It's like yeah. five years in a room with Miles and Harry and me. And then that last scene with Harry when he passed, I knew he wouldn't be there in the room with me anymore and I couldn't go into that room for like three weeks. I had to pack up his stuff. I was like, it's like someone had died. I really went into like grief. It was terrible. I knew that Miles and Harry, that was it. They weren't going to come and talk to me anymore. They're gone. Yeah. But what is cool is then people read the book and then they talk to me about Harry and Miles and they have yeah. whole 
like they made up Miles's whole future story. Like they tell yeah. me, oh yeah, he lives in like Byron Bay with Joe, and he's like a furniture <laughs> designer, and this and that. I'm like, what? Um, <laughs> and they tell me like it's in the book, but it's yeah. cool, and so they're still there. I'm like, oh, they came back to me, just not now that they like talking to everyone, not just me. Yeah. I think that's the best part of writing is sharing it with other people, and as well letting other people put their experiences and interpretations on it because it can mean something completely different from one person to another when the night comes as well. Because that's a story about, like, the moments that change us, I guess. Yep. And I wanted to ask if there was a specific moment in your life that you think changed you to that extent. So when the night comes is, like, it's about a real ship and this ship, I I knew this ship and I was obsessed with this ship. That was a ch- big life moment for me. So at that time when we knew some of these Danish sailors on that ship, that changed my life because Hobart was really grey and dull and kind of one kind of people, you know, just like mm. white middle class <laughs> and working class people and um, suddenly there was like, these huge Vikings in town and full of life and adventure and sailing to Antarctica and it made the world big. I was like, oh, my God, you can go to Denmark. Like you can go to Antarctica. Like I was suddenly like you can get off this island. (laughs) So I decided that I was going to be a sailor and go on Nella down and go to Antarctica. And so then when she was scuttled and went down, I just put that dream away and the Danes were gone, you know, they were gone forever. And I was unpacking a box and I found a photo of this ship, Nella Dan, that used to be on my wall. And I just was like, oh, my God, i gotta, I got to find out everything that ever happened about this ship now just for my own research. So I started this journey that turned into the book. But as a result, I got to meet all of the Danes again in oh, Denmark wow. I went and talked to them they're now like all this big group and had this massive reunion it's like created this like there's a museum in Denmark now that have a big Nella Dan display thanks oh. to all of this all of the Danes they kind of healed because of this book but I got to go to Antarctica because of the book so I got the fellowship to go to Antarctica and so that was a dream for me I finally got to be that sailor. I wanted to also talk about Wandi, the new book, because that is your yes. first children's book. I want to show you. It is. I will. I've got the coffees here. Oh my How God, cute is this? So adorable. And it's got internal um, illustrations. And we've got all this merch for the to raise money for yeah. the Wandi. So we've got like these little Wandy oh toys my and they've got like a Wandy bandana on the back, like just like the book title that this woman so cool. made for free for us. She's so cool. So we needed it to be a bestseller because all the money goes to the Dingo yeah. Foundation. We just want as many kids to read it to just realise how endangered Alpine Dingoes are and yeah. how much they need our help. So that's why I wrote it. Yeah. Um, it's the most important thing I've ever done. It actually matters. Like we've got this much time to save our pine dingoes before the mm-hmm. like Tasmanian tiger is gone forever. And the way people see them is wrong and the information's wrong. And yeah. so if I can start from kids and get them to just be obsessed with this, the smartest dog species in the world by far, and that's been proven by universities across the globe. So we need to be proud of this little cutest dingo in the world because I know literature has obviously changed a lot even in the past couple of decades um yeah do you think people are starting to move away from that as we move into a more digital kind of focused age what challenges do you think that that presents to authors and writers at the start of my career in when Pastor Chellis came out in 2011 bookshops were declared dead and it was when Mm. a lot of bookshops went under because of a big chain bookshop that went bankrupt because of a company on top of that. So it wasn't really about bookshops but it sent this panic, you know, the novel's dead, the bookshops are dead and that didn't happen. Even during the pandemic, my publishers 
sales have been pretty good, which gives me a lot of hope. However, I think people are also relying on other storytelling, like, you know, TV shows that change you, that make you um, want to be a better person or tell you about something and um, inform you. It's just changing, but there's still stories and writers are still going to find their place because we need stories. We, we have since the beginning of time. So I feel hopeful that it's, it's going to be okay. We'll just evolve and it's cool what's happening. And I don't think we have to be frightened about the changes. It's great. Coming out from that in Australia in particular, what do you think, I guess, is the future of Australian writers? Because I, I am... think this lockdown, I've been trying to read more Australian stories because I guess a lot of the things you see online and things like that are American or English or etc. Yeah. So it's definitely dominated popular culture. And it has. I find that Australian anything, but especially Australian literature, is very underrated on a global scale. Oh, man, so much. So much so. Um, one of the reasons is we're still seen as the colony by yeah. the UK a lot. And I, I don't mean by the average person in the UK. I meant by the system. Mm. Also, I think we've got a crin. We've got this thing like, oh, we're not good enough. Our mm. books aren't good enough, so I want to read uh, the good books. So I'll read English books or American writers. But what I'm really excited about is I feel like we're just on the cusp of all of these new voices that are about to bust onto the scene, you know, from refugee Australians, African Australians, um, yeah, Western Sydney, the voices we haven't heard from before, working class. It kind of is that a lot of the writers right now have a similar background in that they're creative writing, PhD, kind of middle class and there's nothing wrong with that nothing but we need to hear from everyone else as well yeah. to have a full canon and then I think we can you know stand up and say we've really Australian writings has come so far and there's room for all of us and I'm really excited I want to hear from those who don't have voice yet you've mentioned a lot the word hope which I've kind of latched onto I guess yeah. and I think that really does reflect who you are because all your stories, even though some are very sad, <laughs> they're also full of hope. Um, and they are. volunteering for the dingoes as well, that's very hopeful. Um, it is. So um, how you came to that kind of ideal of hope as your main kind of focus? That's really hard. I know with... With this book, I mean, this If you th this plan is so sad, it will make you cry right out. Huh? <laughs> but there has to be hope, right? There has yeah. to be hope for Wandy is hope because he proves that there's Alpine Diggos out there and he came to us for a reason. So I've got to have that hope. I've got to take that hope and I've got to share that hope because if people don't have hope, they're not going to try and save Alpine Dingoes. Yeah. Or they're not going to try and be better or they're not going to try and fight climate change or try and fight racism. They're just going to, if we have no hope, we've got no energy. People would call me, I don't know, a bit juvenile or a bit um, naive, mm. gullible. <laughs> and if to feel that little bit of hope is to know that maybe it's possible, maybe it's possible that you'll be a published writer. And this is the other thing that my brother would always say to me. He's like, fave somebody gets published right people get published as books in the bookshop so why not you and oh, yeah. sit with that question and that's hard because then that's like well I'm not good enough I don't deserve it and blah 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 but it also can plant a little bit of hope like yeah it is possible for a postman to become or a post person to become a writer I did it yeah. It's possible. So um, that then in turn gives you more hope that maybe it's possible that I can write a kid's book. Oh, I did it. It was really hard and I think it's going to be good. I hope. I hope. Yeah. I go in that writing room with just a little bit of hope. Since the start of the year, sorry, January, I just took up roller skating because of lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> so I bought some skates 
And I thought, oh, yeah, and I put them on and I just fell over and I was like, oh. (laughs) And I met these other adults that skate and they helped me and fix my skates and, like, we all, like, are learning together and I can now skate. I can fully skate backwards. I can do spins and I'm just getting better and that gives me hope too. I'm like, man, you can try something and you're going to be terrible at it and you're going to be terrible at it and you're going to be terrible at it but you keep going and you keep going and you keep going and you get a little bit better. And but whereas if you just put your skates on full over and go, oh, this is really hard. I'm not doing it anymore. And put your skates away. Yeah. You're never going to be able to skate backwards. So that has been really helping me too. If there was one thing that you could tell that little girl growing up in Tasmania, what would you tell her? Just like be yourself and don't worry what anyone else thinks. Daydream and be sensitive, and no one can tell you what's wrong, and it's all going to work out okay. Yeah. So just hang in there. But also I might tell her, like, really go and be a sailor because that was kind of cool. <laughs> I wasted a lot of time, you know, not feeling good enough and I, yeah. I would probably tell myself too to just like, hey, when you finish high school, just keep writing. Even if you don't send it out to anyone, don't give that up. Well, thank you so, so much. Oh, my You've pleasure. Absolutely I, amazing. I hope so. I rambled a lot. Um, Again. Keep Going with that novel and poetry yeah, when you've I got will. time. I mean, do you study first, but then. Okay. okay. Thank you Bye. so much. And oh, thank pleasure. You for being Bye. like such an inspiration as well. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>